One of the most ambitious goals we have for this semester is to be able to answer the question, what all groups are out there? What kinds of group structures are we even able to make out of a finite set of objects? And so we just gained something really, really powerful as a consequence of Lagrange's theorem. If I'm going to ask the question, what groups of a certain order exist? We've seen now that if the order that I want is a prime number, that every single group whose order is a prime number is a cyclic group. In other words, up to isomorphism, there is only one kind of finite group with a prime number of elements, the cyclic group of order p. This was a consequence of Lagrange's theorem because Lagrange guarantees that the order of any element in such group is either going to be equal to 1 or equal to p, because the order of that element has to be a divisor of the order of the group, and here the order of the group is prime. And because this shows for sure that as long as there is a non-identity element in this group, there must be an element of order p, which is therefore a generator for this group, it proves this group is cyclic and therefore isomorphic to the additive group of integers mod p. And that means that we get to fill out actually quite a bit of this table. For every prime number you give me, I can tell you any group that has that order is going to be isomorphic to z mod p. So how many groups are there of order 1? There's only one. It's z mod 1, the trivial group. There's only one group of order 2. There's only one group of order 3, up to isomorphism, and so on for the rest of the primes. And so now, these rows in this table list completely all of the possible isomorphism classes of groups with that given order. There's no other way to make a group that has a prime number of elements. And so it's going to be a goal for us for the rest of this semester to fill out as much of this kind of a table as we can. For example, what if p is not prime? What if it's 4? How many different groups of order 4 are there up to isomorphism? What about order 6? What about order 9, 12, 16? The further away we get from primality, the more interesting these questions become. So a lot of the tools that we develop over the second half of this first semester are going to be devoted to figuring out how to take groups that we understand and put them together to form larger, more intricate groups, or conversely, to take a large group that we don't understand and break it apart into simpler pieces that we can. So the next result we're going to look at that also follows from Lagrange's theorem tells us not just how to classify groups of prime order, but how to classify groups whose order is twice that of a prime. One of the key ingredients of this proof is called the product theorem. We're going to prove this product theorem in a different video, but for right now I just want to mention what the statement of this theorem is because we're going to need it in a minute. The product theorem says that if I take two subgroups, h and k, of a group g, and I multiply all the elements of h by all the elements of k, that forms a subset of g. It's not necessarily a subgroup, it's a subset. How many elements are in that subset is related to the products of the orders of h and k by this formula. It says that if I multiply together the orders of h and k, that product is the same as the number of elements in this product set multiplied by the number of elements in the intersection, the overlap of h and k. We're going to need this result in a minute when we classify all of the groups that have a double prime order. And here's that classification along with its proof. This theorem says that if I have a group of order 2p, where p is a prime greater than or equal to 3, so it's an odd prime multiplied by 2, either that group is isomorphic to z mod 2p, in other words, either it's a cyclic group of order 2p, or there's one other possibility, and that is that it's isomorphic to the dihedral group of the regular p-gon. These are the only two examples of isomorphism classes of groups whose order is twice a prime twice an odd prime, I suppose. So how are we going to prove this classification theorem? As you might expect, Lagrange's theorem is a key element to this classification as well. Because this is a disjunctive statement, because it's an either-or, we're going to prove this using the strategy of disjunctive syllogism. We're going to prove that if the first condition does not hold, then the second condition must hold. In other words, if I have a group of order 2p, that's not a cyclic group, then we're going to prove that it's isomorphic to the dihedral group of the p-gon. 
So we'll begin this disjunction by assuming that G is not cyclic. And asking the question, what can the orders of the elements in G be? So let's suppose I could diagram out my group. Let's say that these boxes are the, the 2p different elements of my group G. What can the orders of those elements be? Well, Lagrange's theorem has something to say about that. Lagrange's theorem says that the orders of elements have to be divisors of the order of the group. But the only divisors of 2p are going to be either divisors of 2 or divisors of p, because 2 and p are relatively prime to one another. So the only possible orders for elements, according to Lagrange's theorem, are 1, 2, p, and 2p. Now we don't necessarily have elements of all those orders, so let's begin to start to rule some stuff out. For example, because G is not a cyclic group, we know that we cannot have an element of order 2p in my group. If we did, it would generate all the elements of the group and therefore make the group cyclic. So already we can rule out the possibility that this group has an element of order 2p. All right, what about the, the others, 1, 2, and p? Well, we know we're going to have an element of order 1. Every group has an element of order 1, namely its identity element. So really, the rest of the story is about the 2s and the p's. Do we have elements of order 2? Do we have elements of order p? Let's start by thinking about order p. Do we know for sure that there will be an element of order p in this group? We're going to show that the answer is yes by contradiction. So let's assume that there is no order p element in this group. That means that every single element in this group would have either order 1 or order 2. It would be a group of involutions, sometimes called a Boolean group. Every non-identity element would be its own inverse in this case. But when that's the case, we've seen before in a homework problem, that that makes this group abelian. So now let's imagine that I have this abelian group of order 2p, and all of its elements have order 2. Let me take two of those elements. We call them A and B, two different elements A and B. Each one of them has order 2. And because G is abelian, they commute with one another. And therefore, the subset consisting of E, A, B, and AB is closed as a subset of my group. And because it's closed and it contains the identity and my group is finite, the finite subgroup test guarantees that this is then a subgroup of my group. But it's a subgroup that has four elements. And we know that this group G cannot have a four element subgroup, again, by Lagrange's theorem. Because we don't know what 2p is, but we know how many times the number 2 goes into it. It goes in once and no more, because p is not divisible by 2. Therefore, the order of my group is not divisible by 4, and I cannot therefore have a four element subgroup. And so my contradictory hypothesis, that there is no order p element in my group, cannot be sustained. Therefore, we must have an element of order p. I'm going to say that a is my element of order p. And in my diagram here, I'm going to shade out the cyclic subgroup generated by a. It's going to have p elements in it. I'm going to think of it as the first row in this diagram. And if you like, the second row is going to be the coset of this subgroup by any element which doesn't belong to it. That's an important observation that we're going to need in another minute. So now we know that our group must have an element of order p. What about the elements of order 2? What can we say about them? What can I say about any element which doesn't belong to this subgroup up here? So I'm going to pick an element outside of that subgroup, call it b. If b doesn't belong to the cyclic subgroup generated by a, if b is not a power of a, in other words, we're going to prove that b must be an element of order 2. And because my b is being chosen arbitrarily on this row, if I can prove this in generality, it will show that all these elements that are not a power of a are going to be involutions, power, uh, order 2. They're going to be their own inverses. Let's see why that is, again by contradiction. Suppose that b is not an element of order 2. Then according to, again, Lagrange's theorem, either b has order 1 and is therefore the identity, but the identity already belongs to this subgroup, or the only other option is that the order of b must be p. So that's how we're going to proceed in this contradiction. 
But if the order of B is P, that means that the cyclic subgroup generated by B has P different elements in it. I'm going to kind of list them like this, B, B squared, up to the P minus first power, and then it wraps back around to the identity. But now let's think about what the intersection between the cyclic subgroup generated by A and the cyclic subgroup generated by B must be. Well, that intersection of subgroups has to be a subgroup both of my purple row and of my orange column. It needs to be a subgroup of both of those cyclic subgroups. After all, it's the intersection. But both of those cyclic subgroups have order P. And then again, by Lagrange's theorem, any subgroup of the purple row and any subgroup of the orange column must be either order 1 or order P. But if it's equal to order P, that means that that intersection gives me everything in that row or everything in that column. And that can't be the case because we know that the orange column has something that the purple row does not, namely the element B. So they can't coincide, therefore they can't have order P, and therefore they must have order 1. So this intersection must consist only of the identity element. So now we know that this picture is more or less accurate, that I have the cyclic subgroup generated by A and the cyclic subgroup generated by B, and the only thing that they share in common is the identity element. So why is this bad news? Well, let's return to that product theorem that we stated a few minutes ago. The product theorem says that if I multiply together the orders of two subgroups, H and K, two finite subgroups of a group, that the product of those orders is equal to the order, the cardinality, I should say, of the product of the two sets multiplied by the order of the intersection subgroup. And we know the left-hand side of this equation for uh, the role of H being played by the cyclic subgroup generated by A, the role of K being played by the cyclic subgroup generated by B, each of those orders is equal to P, and the order of the intersection of H and K, which we just figured out was a trivial intersection, that order is equal to 1. But then this product theorem, therefore, tells me that the order of the product set HK, the cardinality, must be equal to P squared. But all of the elements in HK, the product set, are elements in my group G by closure. But there's only two P elements in my group to choose from. Therefore, the cardinality of the set has to be less than or equal to 2P. But there is no prime number greater than or equal to 3 for which its square is less than or equal to its double. Therefore, this inequality cannot happen. And so our contradictory assumption that the order of B is equal to P cannot be sustained. And so, again, by disjunctive syllogism, that must mean that the order of B is 2. So we can't have another order P element that's outside of the powers of A. Therefore, B must be an element of order 2. We're almost there. What we have so far is one element in my group, which has order P, and so we kind of think it's going to behave like the rotation that happens inside of the, the symmetry group of a regular n-gon. A here is playing the role that R plays in the dihedral group. Similarly, we have an element B, which is not part of that set of powers of A, and has order 2. So we're going to think of B here as playing the role of T, the reflection inside of the dihedral group. All we need to do now is verify that A and B interact with one another in the same way that T and R interact with one another in the dihedral group. So let's think about the other elements that I haven't listed. For example, what about AB? That's going to be an element that belongs to uh, the coset of the, the purple row here when I multiply by B, so I'm going to put it right there. What can we say about AB? And, what, and by extension, what can we say about the rest of the elements in that row? Well, when we proved that B must have order 2, there was nothing special about it being the element B. The proof that we did over here holds for every element that doesn't belong to the powers of A. Therefore, all of these elements have order 2 as well. So what this diagram here is doing is it's kind of dividing all the elements in my group into a set of them that have order P, and the identity, I suppose, so that's the subgroup generated by A. And then everything that's not part of that subgroup is an element of order 2. For example, AB is one of those elements. And since it's an element of order 2, that means it's equal to its own inverse. But now the shoes and socks formula applied to that 
says that that's equal to B inverse times A inverse. The inverse of a product is the opposite product of the inverses. But B is also an element of order 2, therefore B inverse is equal to B. And if we read this result from beginning to end, we find out that AB is equal to B times A inverse. That is exactly the same relation that characterizes how T and R interact with one another in the dihedral group. RT is equal to T times R inverse. And therefore everything that we know about A and B is exactly the same as everything that we know about T and R in the dihedral group of the pigon. Namely, that T, in other words B, is an element of order 2, that R, in other words A, is an element whose order is P, the same number of sides as I have in my polygon, and that when they interact with one another, RT is equal to T times R inverse. And that is sufficient evidence that G is indeed isomorphic to the dihedral group of the pigon. And the isomorphism is exactly the one that sends A in my group G to R in the dihedral group of the pigon, and it sends B in my group to the element T in the dihedral group of the pigon. And so we have really won something special here. We have not only classified all the groups of prime order using Lagrange's theorem, we have now also been able to successfully classify all the groups of double prime order using Lagrange's theorem and this product formula. So anytime we can add another row to this chart is a cause for celebration. We already had all the groups of prime order totally classified, and now we will be able to classify the groups of double prime order. So we'll be able to say, what are all the groups up to isomorphism of order 6? What are all the groups of order 10? What are all the groups of order 14? And so forth and so forth. And according to our theorem, all those groups are either going to be cyclic, so the groups of order 6 are going to include Z6, the groups of order 10 are going to include Z mod 10, and so forth. But now there's also a second possibility. And the second possibility is that those groups are isomorphic to the respective dihedral groups of the regular polygons. So the only groups up to isomorphism of order 6 are the cyclic group of order 6 and the dihedral group of the triangle of order 10, the cyclic group of order 10, and the dihedral group of the pentagon. Order 14, it's only the cyclic group of order 14 and the dihedral group of the regular heptagon. And so now we have a bunch more rows in this table completely filled out. We know how to classify every single finite group up to isomorphism when the order of that group is a prime, and when the order of that group is twice a prime. We're going to continue to build on top of this table as we get further and further into the semester, as we learn more about how to put together simpler groups into more complex structures, and how to break apart complex groups into their simpler pieces.